as you know, there is a da dashing, handsome Malayali on stage, and also it's Shashi Tharoor. Also. <laughs> <laughs> and let me introduce Shashi Tharoor also. Um, so it is very risky for a columnist to uh, ask a politi politician to confirm a theory that the columnist has just proposed, but I'm going to take that risk and try that. You know, when, uh, when Priyanka Gandhi entered, polit entered electoral politics formally, uh, people again said that, oh, the most powerful members of the Congress, they feel they're subordinate to the Gandhi family. Uh, but I feel that is not true. I feel that uh, uh, P. Chidambaram's best bet is actually P. Chidambaram. And uh, Kapil Sibyl's best bet is Kapil Sibyl. And Shashi Tharoor's best bet in any walk of life is, is Shashi Tharoor. Uh, but who is their second best idea in the Congress? And I think that is where the Gandhi family becomes powerful. It is sometimes the second best idea is more powerful than the best idea because the best idea is you and the second best idea is everyone's second best idea. Do you agree? <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, the fact is that uh, if I've got your thesis right and I don't want to be uh, misinterpreting it, if you're saying that essentially to put forward uh, a certain vision of the country is more important than advancing individual ambitions, I agree. Secondly, that in a party like the Congress, the leadership is really not up for grabs. We know who is going to lead the party. But we are in the party, the likes of the people you mentioned, because we believe it is the best vehicle for advancing our vision of a decent, pluralist, progressive India that can take India in the right direction in the rest of the century. So for this kind of vision, um, as far as I'm concerned, the individual embodies the party rather than worrying about who may be best or not best or second best for anything else. It's the values of the party we're trying to put forward. Okay. But in the event that Congress comes to power uh, this year, um, who do you think is going to be the prime minister? Well, if we, if we win a majority, it'll be our president, be Rahul Gandhi. Okay. If we end up having he, he, to... He will be the prime minister. Well, he's the president okay. of the party. It's okay. logical that if we win a majority, the leader of our party will uh, make the bid for the prime ministership. However, if we don't win a majority and we have to form a coalition, then everything depends, number one, on the actual numbers, and number two on the consensus that needs to be arrived at with the other parties. I mean, in uh, 2004, we only won 145 seats, yeah. but the UPA collectively got together and asked Sonia Gandhi to take over the leadership, and she made way, as you know, for Dr. Manmohan Singh. No one would necessarily have assumed that the Congress would have insisted on that position with 145, but it was offered to us. Okay. Tomorrow, let's see what the numbers are, and what the other parties, if we need other parties, come up with. It really is early days. And as you know, polling is not a terribly scientific uh, uh, practice in our country. In that nine times out of 10, or even arguably 19 times out of 20, predictive polls turn out to be wrong. Yeah. So in these circumstances, largely because of the size of our country, the variety of constituencies, the diversity within them, the complication, the, the impossibility of taking into account the various caste, religious, and other factors in getting a representative sample. As a result, no sample is ever scientifically valid. Everything is by definition random. And even uh, somebody was publishing a poll last week, one of our major magazines, boasting that it was the largest ever sample. They had sampled 23,446 people. Now, 23,446 is what percent of 1.2 billion? Is what percent of the 775 million registered voters? So, you know, you're looking at something which by definition can't be representative. So I don't trust the polls, but I would say that in a Lok Sabha election, people vote for two things. They vote for the person who can best represent their constituency and their local needs and wishes, and they vote for the party they would like to see in power. So the combination of all of those votes will give us a parliament, and that parliament will determine, through the combination of parties within it, who is likely to be prime minister. Now, talking about uh, election prediction, I, um, even though I'm a journalist, I, have, I, I don't have my own way of uh, analyzing politics. 
I just have a group of intellectuals. I follow them and I know that whatever they say, the opposite will come true. <laughs> uh, like Yogendra Yadav is my especially, I mean, I'm, very, I'm very fond of him because he helps me project elections. But there is something there where we feel that there's a particular kind of Indian uh, intellectual seems, uh, the, the, in, the Indian voter seems to think exactly with the, op whatever the intellectual thinks, uh, is uh, the, the Indian voter has a completely different view. Uh, do, do you see that changing? Do you, as the Indian middle class grows, do you see any... Uh changing, but changing very gradually, Manu. That is that as the um, Indian middle class grows, there's no question that it demands a much more performance-oriented politics. We have been moving, I would say, over the last generation from a politics of identity to a politics of performance. That is that when Lalu Prasad Yadav, to take an example, actually managed to win not one but two elections on a strongly identitarian appeal, then uh, the, uh, the uh, third election that he tried, uh, uh, the message was from the voters and from the rival candidates, where is our Bijli, where is our Sadak, where is our Pani? And with that, the electricity, water, good road, security kind of message, he lost a bit for re-election. So in other words, the limitations of an identity appeal were brought to bear in the process of that election. I would argue that by and large voters are identifying more and more with the proposition that they vote for somebody not just to represent them but to get things done for them. Kerala has already had that view for some time. As a Kerala MP for 10 years, I can tell you it's a very demanding electorate that's fully aware of its rights and its claims on the person it has sent to parliament. Uh, in other parts of India, that has been less true, and amongst different segments of society, it has been less true, but it's becoming more true. And if the rest of the country becomes like Kerala, then you will indeed have a very strongly performance-oriented politics. Uh, why shouldn't people vote for Narendra Modi? What are the reasons, in your view, people will vote Modi out? So that's why I've written this 500-page book, which, as I confessed, is more than just an exercise in floxin or nihilification. It, it really is um, a way of laying out very clearly. I mean, I should move back a bit and say when, when Modi was first elected and made a lot of very impressive speeches after his election, uh, I welcomed those speeches and was pilloried by my side of the ideological divide, saying, how can you... How can you say good things about this man? And my answer was at that point twofold. I said, number one, we have to show respect for the electorate that has just put him in that office. And, and as Democrats, we must respect the wishes of our, of our citizens. But my second reason was that by taking him at his word, by hailing the promises, the vocabulary, the language that he has uttered, we actually set the bar against which we can judge him for his actions. So when he says, sabka saad sabka vikas, I will promote development for everybody. When he says, I will be a prime minister for all Indians, moving away from the sectarian agenda. When he says, the constitution is my holy book, moving away from the Hindu Rashtra that his party had stood for. When we see all of these things being said, by seizing upon them and saying, well said, Mr. Modi, we are also holding him accountable to fulfill those things. However, within six months, it became very clear that uh, those hopes were belied because I published in December 2014 a book called India Shastra, uh, Reflections on the Nation in Our Time, which was mainly a collection of essays written over the preceding six, seven years. But in the introductory essay, I said that there is a contradiction at the heart of Mr. Modi's rule, which is that he says all these liberal things, makes these liberal pronouncements but rests for political support and viability on the most illiberal elements in Indian society. And that in this, in this contradiction I wrote, may lie the seeds of his future failure. So that's December 2014, and Mr. Modi seems to have spent the next four and a half years proving me right. So the paradoxical prime minister is a stock-taking. But because it is researched and footnoted and substantiated, it's a rather detailed stock-taking, Divided into five sections, one is a sort of profile of the gentleman and, and his life and what he lived for and what he's like and includes a slightly 
sort of interesting, I hope, comparison with the career of Mr. Erdogan, which I'm sure Mr. Modi would like to emulate. Um, then I have four sections. One is called the modification of India, the rise of communal language, the, the, the bizarre phenomenon of cow vigilantism where human beings are being attacked and killed uh, in the name of cow protection, where I see the rise of a certain intolerance that used to be frowned upon even if it existed sub rosa in other parts of the country. Second, I talk about his governance. He's a man who told us famously, I believe in minimum government, maximum governance. Well, the rest of the government may have been minimized, but Mr. Modi's power has been maximized. And we have the most centralized, top-down, overpowerful PMO since Mrs. Gandhi's emergency. And what is more, it is a PMO which takes all the decisions itself so that decisions that previously had been delegated to various ministries now have to be referred to the prime minister's office. And as a result, very many pinned. These are the people who attacked the Congress for policy paralysis. We've never had as many vacancies in UPA as these people have had. They presided over large numbers of vacancies because they don't have the time to fill all the positions that they have to decide and won't leave to the ministries. We have ministers at question hour who haven't a clue about the policies they're being asked to defend because the policies have been made in the PMO, sometimes bypassing the ministers and talking to their secretaries. So the bureaucrats are busy slipping notes to the ministers to answer the questions that they ought to have been confident of because they're formulating the policy. We've got a situation where institutions in India are being hollowed out from the Supreme Court to the CBI, the latest farce, to the Information Commission, to the Reserve Bank of India, whose catapults and, and somersaults during the demonetization led many to dub it the Reverse Bank of India instead of the Reserve Bank of India. All of this, all of these institutions that we had built up with autonomy and with strength and with... with uh, but you know, don't you think well, in all India... That's been, so just to finish the list, then a section on economics, the disaster of demonetization, the botched rollout of GST, the collapse of the agriculture sector, the lack of support across the board for economic growth and development, uh, joblessness, the whole crisis of unemployment in our country, and then a final section on foreign policy because when you make these arguments to Modi Bhakts, the immediate reaction, but at least he has raised India's image in the world. He hasn't, and I explained that as well at some length. So that's what the book is about, and those are all substantive reasons why Mr. Modi and his government don't deserve a second term. But part of this is also political spiel. Now, if you take uh, even, even this talk of institutions, which the Indian uh, liberal media keeps talking about, but when you look carefully at what is the meaning of institution in, uh, in a democratic country like India, there is an argument that an institution is actually an autocracy of the elite, which want to control elected politicians. So I don't see any great uh, uh, crisis in the clash between institutions which are controlled by the intellectual elite and the elected politicians who have only the real people to go to. So maybe this whole argument that institution is something great and it's a temple of democracy is naturally promoted by a certain uh, westernized Indian liberals because they, they can't get votes. I mean, except you. I think most people who speak like you won't win an election. <laughs> All right, let, let me, well, I certainly intend to do my best to win the next election, but having said that, let me say that uh, that's not entirely right, because the strength of institutions in a democracy is to offer an alternative to one-party rule or one-man rule, or to the kind of tyranny that many people close to and around Mr. Modi have shown a proclivity But have for. they ever, have the institutions ever really been as independent yes, as... Yes, I mean, the Supreme Court's a very good example. It has constantly brooked, uh, has challenged the, um, the government of the day. There was one notorious example otherwise, uh, which was then undone uh, shortly thereafter by another bench. The independence of the Supreme Court has in many ways been uh, something that therefore assured a public that may have had misgivings about specific decisions of the government that there would be a reference point beyond which the government couldn't leap. Uh, Reserve Bank of India, the integrity of our currency and the monetary policies that run it is what allows us to trust a piece of paper. The days when we had gold and coins and silver and so on are gone, right? What's the piece of paper worth? It's worth 
what the Reserve Bank is worth and the strength it gives us, and that's why we need but it. All, all, all over the world, elected politicians are trying to control their central banks. So, uh, but all over the world in democracies, these are being kept fairly free of that kind of control. The Federal Reserve, for example, the president has the power to appoint the chief, but thereafter, he can't control what the man says, does, or the woman, for that matter, says, does, uh, or, or decides. And I think the strength of this in most countries is precisely that you create through a complex set of institutions the checks and balances that restrain the potential for overweening power. That's all. I mean, um, but it's important because, for example, I, I was talking this morning about Jawaharlal Nehru, my 15-year-old book, Nehru, The Invention of India, was reissued by Penguin just a couple of months ago because they felt it was so relevant for our times. And I mentioned the anecdote of Nehru, who was a short-tempered man, uh, losing his cool and saying something intemperate about a judge at a press conference. By the end of that day, he had written a letter of apology to the judge, apologizing for insulting him. And then more, more significant, he wrote a public letter, a groveling letter to the Chief Justice of India begging forgiveness for having insulted the judiciary. He didn't need to do that. He was by far the most powerful figure in India at the time this happened. But he did it to convey a message that institutions are also above political control, that he owes, therefore, that deference and that respect to the Supreme Court, and he wants to convey that uh, through his apology. And I think that's a stark contrast with what happened exactly a year ago when the four most senior judges of the Supreme Court after the Chief Justice actually invited the press to an impromptu conference on their lawn, the Supreme Court lawns, to protest against a threat to democracy from the government's attempts to suborn the judicial system. So I think it seems so to has, me there is a What has the new Chief Justice done, which is dramatically different from well, the old... Well, he certainly... Judges have come up with, with decisions we like and decisions we don't like. That's true probably of every political party in this country. Um, they've also deferred decisions um, beyond what's convenient for politicians in terms of their timetables. So judges march to their own beat and to their own calendar. The fact still is that at least after this cri de curve, this, this sort of uh, appeal for uh, uh, stirring up the conscience of the public that we saw last January, everyone is on guard, including the government, that they can't go too far because the court will brook no interference beyond the point. Thereafter, the judgments are, are not vitiated. I mean, it's the same thing that you've seen other other institutions. Um, the Election Commission, for example, is rather shocking. The Election Commission has been growing in authority and independence over the years, but for the first time, it actually suffered strictures from the Delhi High Court for a blatantly partisan decision to suspend 20 legislators of the Aam Aadmi Party. Now, this never happened before. And so, why is it happening under this government? We believe it's because this government genuinely doesn't respect institutions, appoints people it believes it can pressure and tries to pressure them. And it's right to call these things out. And thank God we have an independent high court that could call it out. Imagine if all these institutions, even if they were occupied by uh, unelected elites, as you're complaining, if they didn't exist, the elected uh, uh, elites, if, since after all, any minority is an elite, that, unelect that elected elite would run roughshod over the rest of us and over our systems. That's why I think this is useful to have these institutions. And Mr. Modi and his government have not shown the respect for institutions that we should all value. Uh, what do you like about him? Or maybe I should call it, give me three things that you like about Modi, apart from his early speeches. Apart from his early speeches. I, I, I like the fact that a person of humble origins has risen to the most powerful office in the land. In many ways, it is a, an affirmation of Indian democracy. And when I said this last time, I was deliberately misquoted, so let me put it in context. I said it's an affirmation of Indian democracy that a Chaiwala could be the Prime Minister of India. By which I don't mean to typecast Mr. Modi or denigrate him. I mean that somebody who as a boy actually served tea at a railway station stall is today the Prime Minister is actually a very good reflection of our democracy. And I did not mean it as a disparaging comment as the media reported it. It's actually, to my mind, a great sign that our country works at that level. So you do, believe, second, you do believe that he actually sold tea? Well, you do, you I'm don't. told I shouldn't believe it by 
people perhaps know better than me. All I can say is what I have read and what I've heard him say. And on that basis, yes, I mean, there was a, there was a, a, a fairly thorough investigative uh, account of Modi before he became prime minister. But we know Joseph and the caravan who interviewed some people who remembered Modi's father running a tea stall on the station. And it's entirely likely that after school, Modi would hop over the tracks and help his father. So I actually, I'm inclined more to believe it than not to believe it. But I agree with you, some people claim it's, it's completely mythologizing. However, let me take that story at face value and say, if somebody from such a background as Prime Minister today, that reflects well on our society and our polity and our democracy. The second thing I like about Mr. Modi is his energy. Uh, I, I really value people who are able to give so much of themselves, in my view, for a misguided set of beliefs, but nonetheless give that energy to whatever he's doing. And so, for example, his tireless jet-setting around the world. We in the opposition are occasionally sarcastic about the fact that the 82 countries he's visited in 59 trips has kept him out of India for one full year of the five-year term. Uh, it's also true that he's delivered more speeches in foreign parliaments than he has in the Lok Sabha, which he's a member, where he's usually absent or silent. But, but, still, that tireless energy to actually get on a plane, hop around the world, pump hands, hug the unwilling, and, and sort of convey, <laughs> convey, his, uh, convey his determination to, to uh, project himself and his government's doings on the world stage, you have to have some admiration for what it takes because very few, particularly very few, reach that level of seniority in our system, carry that sort of energy with them. And the third thing I will have to admit, and I don't know how much it sounds convincing to a Malayalam-speaking audience or a Kerala audience, but he is probably the finest orator in Hindi that we've ever seen since independence. I, I've obviously not been alive when some of our famous old politician spoke. I've heard tapes of Nehruji. I've heard some later speeches of others. I've certainly heard Indira Gandhi live and on, on recording. Um, I've heard Vajpayee Saab, both at his peak and later in his, um, in his um, I'm sorry to say, his later declining years when his pauses sometimes were long lengthier than his sentences. But compare with all the famous names you've heard, and you would have to admit that Mr. Modi is in a class by himself. He's fluent, he's articulate, he never seems to be at a loss for the right word. Uh, he um, has this tremendous actor's capacity for modulating his voice, his tone. He is a master of the theatrical gesture. In fact, it wasn't a surprise when this meme went around on Facebook and so on of the two of uh, him meeting Amitabh Bachchan. And the slogan said, India's greatest actor meets Amitabh Bachchan. So, I mean, he really is very good at it. So what does Rahul Gandhi have going for him? First of all, the right ideas. Okay. Mr. Modi boasts of his 56-inch chest. Question that comes up is, does he have a heart behind that 56-inch chest? <laughs> Rahul Gandhi is all heart in many ways. You've seen the spontaneity of his interactions with people, particularly the old and the vulnerable. Um, many a moment when he will leave a stage and go down to the audience and hug an old lady who's in tears and distress about something. This is genuine, this is the guy. I mean, I've, I've seen him at close quarters and I have a lot of respect for his heart and mind. Secondly, his values. You may say these are inherited values, dynasty and all that talk, but these are values he believes in and incarnates. These are values of pluralism or secularism, if you prefer, values of compassion and caring for social justice, values for respect for democracy and the opinions of others, which are healthy in our system and which we seem to find largely lacking in those who are in power today. No, but Rahul Gandhi also reminds me of those posh guys who say the right things, but their lives are a contradiction. For one of the strongest things he said was about five, six years ago when he said, I am the problem. I am a part of the problem. He was talking about nepotism in India where the privileged families pass on the benefit. In fact, power in India is actually transmitted. You know. And he said, I am the problem. And in fact, he also said, I'm not going to get married and I'll never have children because I don't want to perpetuate this. But now we see that he has said all the right things.
but he is not giving up power. On what basis does he believe that he should lead the party? And why can't it be you or someone else? I think it's a question of feeling a sense of responsibility. I think he has been brought up to feel that his family has had a certain, um, shall we say, position as custodians of India's freedom and democracy going back even before Jawaharlal Nehru to Motilal Nehru. There was this identification with the freedom struggle, the sacrifices made. Two members of the family have been assassinated uh, in return for their public service. You are seeing a sense where I can understand fully well. I'm obviously not privy to any private conversations in the family, but I can, I can, I can see somebody saying, all right, you're feeling diffident, you're feeling reluctant because you feel you've inherited this power, but it is your duty. It is your dharma. You have to do this because it is a sacred responsibility conferred upon you. And there was a period when Rahul Gandhi came across as a reluctant politician, but then... Over the last three or four years, I would say he has become a truly convinced politician. I think he has found his inner calling, and that calling is to serve the country and the Congress party. Actually, when you say Rahul Gandhi has a good heart, I actually believe it, though I don't know him at all, and it is somehow it's, it's, it's convincing. But is that enough in Indian politics? Do sometimes people with 56 inches with, with misplaced hearts, are, do they end up doing more good than guys with good hearts who don't know how to win elections. Ah, but that's precisely the challenge facing us today is that there is really, there are two styles of leadership on offer in this country. There is the hero on the white stallion cantering down with upraised sword saying, I know all the answers, I'll solve all the problems, I'll cut through the Gordian knot. And we've seen how badly that's worked out in the last four and a half years. And then you've got a totally different style of leader who says, I don't know all the answers. I'm not even sure I know all the questions. But I will come to you. I will find out what's troubling you, what you need. And I will come with a deep, experienced bench of qualified, able people who will work with me and work with you to solve your problems. Isn't that a better answer in a country as large and diverse as ours than the fellow who says, 56 in chest, I will solve everything? What is one thing about Rahul Gandhi which most people don't know? He is probably the best read Indian politician. Best read? Best read. He okay. reads widely, extensively, and unlike many people who read, he actually retains what he reads. So that um, I had a couple of uh, years on the back benches between my two ministerships when I was seated directly behind him. And so every day in parliament we would chat. And invariably, I mean literally... 99 days out of 100, what he wanted to talk about was a book he was reading, the ideas it provoked in him, seek my reaction to some of them, offer his own observations, and was intellectually amazingly stimulating. People don't see this. Here's somebody whose intellectual curiosity and whose depth of curiosity, you know, the reading was a fairly complex book um, uh, where he, he tried to grasp ideas of how the world was shaped and how the world is working, and he comes up with, with insights into them. I found that fascinating. I still remember I was seated next to him at a lunch in, in Jaipur during our Chintan Shivir in 2013. This is the moment when he was going to be anointed the vice president of the party. And all he wanted to talk about was that he just had lunch with Nicholas Nisim Taleb, the chap who'd written the Black Squan book. And he was sharing with me Taleb's ideas for the just about to be published new book that Taleb had written. Now that's the kind of conversation you can't have with too many people in Indian politics. Actually, since we're talking about Talib, a question on skin, skin in the game where he argues that uh, the problem with current intellectuals is that there is nothing uh, in it for them, they, especially journalists, columnists, you know, some columnists. Uh, so they, they don't know their domain. There is no consequences for going wrong. But he has greater respect for politicians because there are severe consequences. So do you think sometimes, do you sometimes feel as a politician that journalists don't know much and journalism's power is obsolete because things have moved on? No, I welcome good journalism and good opinion writing, column writing, because it seems to me that it offers insights that I might not necessarily get from political conversations with my own colleagues. So I, I've always welcomed fresh perspectives. Even when I was at the UN, I would read 
what people who didn't understand some things about the UN said, simply to know what kind of thinking one needed to be exposed to and be, be aware of to react to it. So I'm not knocking the journalists at all, but there is no question that journalists operate in the world of conclusions and politicians operate in the world of decisions. I've tried to be both, as you know, I continue to write my columns, but it's very easy when you are an apolitical journalist, even if you are a, a journalist with a strong point of view to the right or the left, because ultimately, if things go well, you're still getting published and paid. If things go badly, you're still getting published and paid. But as for a politician, if he takes the wrong decisions, backs the wrong horse, makes the wrong choice, it affects him, his career, the well-being of his constituents, the future of his party, and so on. And so for a politician, being anchored in the real world is actually extremely important. I've learned this to my own cost on, on Shabarimala, where the intellectual position that came almost reflexively to me could not stand the test of actually talking to people in the constituency and seeing how deeply and intimately they felt violated by a decision that I had intellectually thought was a rational one to welcome. Yes. So that was, that was an interesting uh, essay that you wrote. I want to bring in Anna Hazare now. Uh, Anna Hazare was partly responsible for your party's defeat. Yes, he was. He's uh, now on hunger strike again, but he's not making the front and pages. And not many people know that he's on a death fast again, this time in Maharashtra. Uh, so I want to ask you this. Now, it looks like uh, all charges of financial corruption never sticks on the BJP, while anything communal sticks on them. While all charges of communal never sticks on the Congress, though you've been a very communal party yourself, mm, no but, but, all, but all charges of corruption easily sticks to you. So you can go on and on about Rafal. So what is your strategy now? How are you going to take on this giant when this is the case? Well, Rahul Gandhi has been very, very outspoken, even to a point where old-fashioned congressmen are concerned that uh, he has gone beyond the bounds of propriety in saying things like Chaukidar Chorhe, the, the guard is the thief, referring to the prime minister who called himself the nation's Chaukidar. He has, as you know, uh, openly accused the government of diverting taxpayers' money to a few favored capitalists in an exercise of, of, of crony capitalism that marks this government. Has it stuck? You're implying that it hasn't stuck. I would say that the very best that they've been able to do is say there is no proof. Uh, but indeed, it's the job of investigators to unearth proof. Uh, they haven't been able to answer some very obvious questions. Why is it that after a six-year process identifies a need for 126 Rafale aircraft, that after sitting on it for one year, the government suddenly changes it to 36? Why is it that instead of buying 18 off the shelf and assembling 118 in HAL in Bangalore, where Indian employees would have had the work, suddenly all 36 are to be made in a flyaway condition in France, and the 50% offset value is to be given to a friend of Mr. Modi's but, who traveled with him. So are, all of these questions have had no they've real been, answers. They've been answered in many forms, and, but then what you've managed to do, I should grant, is that you've created this doubt in the minds of people that... Uh, something is wrong and it is not just procedural, it is something beyond that. Now, these two questions have not been answered. I mean, the, the first one, why 36 and not 27, 126 has not been answered. Okay. At no point have they been able to give a satisfactory answer. Their cleverness is in saying, well, it's actually 36 instead of 18, so you should applaud us. Sorry. It's 36 instead of 126 that had already been part of the announced scheme. What happened to those planes? You know, you can't be corrupt at the expense of national security. You know, one of the things that hurt NDA a lot was the Cargill coffin scam. Yeah. The feeling that our martyrs had died on the icy slopes of Cargill and a political party was making money off a coffin contract, that was absolutely revolting to the Indian public. And I think there is a feeling that playing fast and loose with the nation's security is in a different order of magnitude from allegedly selling Spectrum too cheap to alleged friends of the telecoms minister, when in fact the courts have found there is no case to answer, and the UPA can argue that in fact the consequence of selling Spectrum cheap was cheaper phone bills for every Indian, and that therefore the 
notional loss the CAG went on about was actually not corruption at all. It was a policy choice. So you're right that, you know, something where arguably, according to the courts, no wrongdoing was done has stuck on the Congress and helped it lose an election. Whereas here, an act of corruption that is imperiling the safety and security of the nation, that act of security, of, 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 of corruption, is not having the same sort of traction. One part of the answer, though arguably only a small part of it, is the extent to which this government has intimidated the media. I know Manu is a representative of the fourth estate. The truth is that we have now got for the first time a government that doesn't hesitate to take action, not so much against editors, though indirectly they are the victims, but against proprietors, because they know that these proprietors have other business interests. And often all it seems to take is a phone call. We have seen example after example of damning and devastating stories about people very close to or related to those in power disappearing overnight from the websites of publications. We have seen an editor starting a hate tracker and being asked to leave and the hate tracker being discontinued. We've seen other editors being dismissed immediately after a searing despair. able to hear me? Was this the reason why the editor of Hindustan Times was asked to leave? Is that, that's is that what you're the, saying? That's certainly the surmise. Okay. I don't want to reveal any, any confidential conversation. Because the editor himself has been silent. The funny thing about Indian journalism is that you will find the editor suddenly leaving and then he keeps quiet. And all his friends start tweeting that Modi got him out. And everybody is saying that except the person who has quit. There's so usually a non-disclosure agreement or some sort of contractual obligation. Correct. Maybe uh, edit editors should severance. choose between free speech and non-disclosure. Well, the problem is if somebody is buying out your contract and you need the money because you are banking on five years of income and you suddenly only have one and a half, uh, maybe you'll feel that you, you need to adhere to the terms under which you can be bought out. I don't know. And I, I so have not even happened? asked you why you left the magazine you left. Yeah, I mean, in fact, I've been very open about it. It was yeah. just very uh, difficult for me to continue as editor because the uh, promoter was very nervous and he felt that... You know, the Modi government wasn't yes, happy with course, your coverage. Yeah. And he appointed no, the editor as much uh, more No, promoted. they wanted a political editor who I thought was very close to the BJP, so I, I, I thought there's no way I would be able to continue. And uh, between me and... I, mean, I said that you, know, you have to choose between the new political editor and the editor and the promoter seemed to hint, though he was very nice, he said, no, you come, let's talk. But I got the feeling that, uh, you know, nobody does these things directly, you know, but then I have been uh, pretty vocal about. But one thing in India is that it is very difficult to be a highly paid journalist in India, but you can be very poorly paid and still have your freedom. So ultimately it comes down to... Uh, but the people at the bottom end of the spectrum, I'm 137 journalists, were killed last year, Manu. It's a world record. And who are these journalists? For the most part, they're at the poor end of the spectrum. Small town journalists, correspondents trying to uh, uh, do muckraking of scandals yes. in a Mufusil area of a state. Somebody drives by, shoots them in the head, the case is never solved. Yes. We've got too many cases like this, and this is what worries people. So in fact, but the real opportunity for resistance is only amongst those editors who can afford not to run that risk, who are not likely to be, who are not likely to be made the victims of local village mafias. Exactly. And those editors also happen to be the better paid ones. Yes. So they have to examine their own conscience and see what to do. This is not an attack on the media. It is, however, an attack on the willingness of those in power today to intimidate the media. And that also partly explains why, when Bofors happened as a quote-unquote scandal, you had day after day of front page headlines for two, three years, Whereas with the Rafal deal, uh, there's an anxiety, it seems, to brush it under the carpet on the part of those who should be selling more copies or increasing their TRPs on the back of that story. Great. We'll open the session to uh, questions from the audience. And at some point, you'll watch me leave. It is not because I'm offended. I have to catch a flight. Okay. There's a lady there, Manu. I'm not going to um, respond to your circumstantial evidence by giving you another circumstances, but... Um, the very fact that you chose to hijack the agenda of media persons and journalists and trying to congressize the entire thing, let me ask you about Gauri Lankesh. You are in government in Karnataka. You guys have the law and order situation with you. 
Where are Gauri Lankesh's killers? I believe Please ask, been, answer, us, answer they've this. They've been arrested, haven't they? As far as I know, they've been arrested. They have not been arrested and they have not been given their due. And would you have done the same had BJP sort of arrested power from you in uh, Karnataka? No, look, Gauri Lankesh not only was a, a, a great tragedy, it's a tragedy. I felt personally one of her last posts on social media was a retweet of a picture that I had, I had uh, posted of nuns doing a Tiruvadira dance. And she had posted, I think her very last post was about how this is what the real India is all about and eat your heart out, Chandiwala's words to that effect. And within two hours, she'd been shot dead. So I, I felt it very keenly. I've met her sister. As far as I'm concerned, action has been taken to the best of my information in that they have identified not only the killer, but the cell to which he belonged and the weapon which he used. If prosecution has been slow, blame it on our system. We are unfortunately very inefficient in moving to the stage of trials, but I have, to the best of my knowledge, the killer has been apprehended. Three or four others in the same cell have been found. There have been media reports revealing who else was on the same killer's target list, and there were three, four prominent other rationalist and, and liberal thinkers who were on his list. And therefore, as far as I'm concerned, the police are doing their duty. If you feel they're not doing it fast enough, that may well be true. But our system, the wheels of justice, do often grind exceedingly slowly. When the Rafael issue, Rafael issue was raised in the parliament, the, the defense, defense minister very emotionally responded that you called me a chore. And you called me and the prime minister a chore. But you were trapped by the emotional response. You never asserted that chores can be called only chores. Who else? Why didn't you uh, respond in that way? One, asserted in well, that Well, in the way. parliamentary procedure, the minister's answer is the last word in the debate. Oh. So there was no further response possible in parliament. Oh. Second question. Rahul Gandhi, what do you think is... Uh, no, the, the Rahul Gandhi is called a papu by this great man now. But then he was performing something like a Papu early three years before. Now he has tremendously changed and transformed. What do you think that is the reason behind the transformation of Rahul Gandhi within these three years? Oh, sorry, do you say why do you think the transformation or what do you think the transformation is? I didn't... Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, he has gone through a process of introspection to figure out really what he, what he wanted to do in life and has decided this is his calling. It's neither a job nor a, uh, uh, an avocation. It is a calling, it's a passion, it's a mission, and he's conducting himself accordingly. This is now very much a full-time politician 24-7 on the job, which is what he was accused earlier of not being sufficiently motivated to do. There is a suggestion that maybe that famous Vipassana he went off to in Southeast Asia played a heart that he got into through the meditation process, got in touch with his inner his inner soul or his inner politician anyway. Um, but whatever the reason may be, that's only speculation. I think he's actually very much con convinced and committed to what he's doing. Uh, first of all, I think uh, Navjot Singh Sidhu is a much better writer in Hindi than Narendra Modi. He's funnier. He's a lot uh, funnier. I, I think he's much better. Okay. And one more thing. Uh, my question is, um, where do you find a common ground between um, modernity and tradition, especially when your party bats for majoritarianism in Kerala in the Shabrimala issue. So where do you think uh, we can find a common ground? No, we do have to constantly struggle for common ground. As many of you know from the positions I have taken and the private members' bills I've introduced, I'm almost always invariably in favor of a more liberal interpretation, either of law or of custom. But in a democracy, it is the duty of elected representatives to also be responsive to the dearly held beliefs of their people. You have to learn the discernment to draw a distinction between mere prejudice and faith. If somebody says women are no good because they have a period once a month, that's prejudice, you don't take it seriously, it's unscientific, it can be dismissed. If somebody says, I go and worship at a particular shrine, because of a whole set of legends around that deity that are precious to me and that I observe in my prayers, then it's a totally different order of objection. I think we can't trivialize 
what happened on Shabrimala uh, by saying that it's merely patriarchy or merely prejudice or it's anti-menstruation. Without being aware of the very many legends around Ayappa, the entire story of, because there are hundreds of Ayappa temples where women of any age can go. But around the Ayappa in Shabrimala, there is the story, as you know, of Malika Puratamma and his vow that he would not behold a woman of reproductive age until he was free to marry her, which he never will be free to marry her. Therefore, he goes and merges his spirit into the, into the existing forest deity in the shrine, and that becomes then the site of pilgrimage for centuries. Now, this story matters to those who go, and particularly mattered in the days when it wasn't so easy to go. Today, you can go and come in a day, but in the old days, that 41 days was absolutely necessary to trek through the forest in very, very difficult conditions and reach the shrine. So the legend that's built up from those days is part of the, the element of faith that surrounds the deity. Now, when people tell me that their most fundamental faith is being violated, I have a very different attitude from when somebody tells me, oh, how can you support a bill legalizing homosexuality because all homosexuality is bad? For me, that's merely prejudice. It has nothing to do with any seriously understood belief. But having talked to very large numbers of people in Tiruvananthapuram, and in particular making it a point to speak to women of that age group, I've realized that my initial intellectual, rationalist, quote-unquote, modern reaction missed out on the extent to which people feel they've literally been kicked by this verdict, how their own most intimate sense of their faith has been violated. That's the, that is the challenge for a political representative. Am I representing these people and their interests, in which case I must have respect for their beliefs? Where a belief is merely prejudice, one can deal with it. Where it's tied up in faith, it's a totally different challenge. And in this case, I think one has to respect faith. Change comes. Inevitably, change comes in every society. But you are, as a political representative, you live in the here and now. You're dealing with today's people, today's beliefs, today's faiths. Manu actually wrote a very interesting piece, which concluded in a, in a line I quoted in one of my articles, saying that if you're arguing that tomorrow the place will be completely modern, everyone can come and go and so on, fine, but you cannot hold today hostage to your hopes for tomorrow. And that is very, very much going back to that distinction between politicians and intellectuals, that's very much the world in which a politician lives in. We live in today. We have to settle these issues there. Yeah, so the judgment, so the Constitution, the Congress position is very clear. We stand with the believers in their sense of their beliefs, but we insist we can only pursue this through constitutional, legal, and peaceful means. We are not out on the streets. We are not obstructing women. We are not vandalizing cars. We are not throwing stones at police. We are not desecrating a holy shrine by turning it into a stage of political theater. Only one party is doing that, and that is the party that, whose president said we have sensed a golden opportunity to pursue our political agenda. That party is out there in the streets. We are not. Let me stress, there is a constitutional process still going on. 6th of February, the Supreme Court will hear a day, maybe even two days of hearings to judge whether this issue requires a full curative review or whether they will stick to their decision, let it go, whether they'll refer it to a larger bench. All of these decisions are just literal over a few days away. We should wait for them. Thereafter, the BJP, which makes such a song and dance in the streets outside Shabrimala, has not lifted a finger to find a constitutional or legislative solution. They have a majority in the Lok Sabha. They can pass a law tomorrow saying that, you know, something the equivalent of Bill Clinton's Freedom of Religion bill that explicitly places certain acts of worship beyond the purview of the Supreme Court. They could do it in an American democracy. They can do it in Indian democracy. But the BGP doesn't want to do it because they don't want a solution. They want the trouble in the streets so that Janam TV can, you know, cover it lovingly 24-7, rise in the TRPs, and they can win votes. It's a cynical political exercise that has nothing to do with either tradition or modernity. Sir, uh, like right now when you were talking about uh, Rahul Gandhi and Narendra Modi, you just mentioned about one leader riding on a stallion and the other one who's like, you know, just unaware and is willing to know what are the problems of the country. 
but do you think it's justified that even at this stage when you know somebody is competing to be the prime minister of the country he's still willing to accept that he is not aware of the problems of the country what no, is no. this he like, he is aware in the broader sense of the problems of the country you've seen the problems he's raised from the corruption in rafal to the unemployment crisis the jobs crisis he makes speeches every day so you know that he's not unaware but what i mean is that he doesn't go around with the hubris that says i know all the answers i'll solve all the problems he's saying i'll come with other people who have had experience in dealing with these issues we'll work with you and see how what's the best way to solve your problem it's a different style of approach but it's not that he doesn't have his own ideas he's expressing them every day i agree to that sir but what i wanted to talk about was the ground level party worker of the inc like are you satisfied with the way it's functioning do you think the hold is still there like it was say 30 or 40 years ago no it's not there the way it was 30 or 40 years ago a lot of things have changed since then and i would say even in the last 27 years since rajiv gandhi's assassination it's been much more of a struggle our best result was actually in 2009 when we got 206 seats and through by elections by the end of that tenure we were at 216 when we lost office calamitously in the election of 2014 now we have to pick up the threads but that experience shows us we still have a hold on the affections of the people we are the only party with a truly national footprint in the sense that even when we lost badly we got one or two seats everywhere north south east west south east north west everything north east south west we got all of that which the bjp did not when they had a much larger majority but we need to build on that instead of just a couple of seats in each of these places we need to go back to the days when we had 10 20 seats in every corner of the country and could then aspire to be a natural party of government since we are Wait, running I'm out of time let's go for one more question yeah last so, question yes. good afternoon sir yes uh, what had happened in 2014 elections could be repeated in uh, when maybe in 2024 or uh, in 2029 uh people don't have a choice they don't have a secular opposition or, uh, to choose to choose for uh, in an election so it doesn't make uh, uh, congress free from correcting themselves what uh, measures are taken by the congress to correct themselves in 5 years that could uh, make the mistakes in uh, last uh, last regime go away and one more thing sir Uh, about the shabrimala verdict it's a verdict made by the constitutional bench um, with uh, with regards to fundamental rights according to uh, sc verdicts it can be reviewed constitutionally so what kind of um, constitutional remedy is congress expecting possibly okay so on, on the first, uh, second one i've actually partly answered already uh, which is to say that uh, they they could decide to keep their ju- judgment they could decide to refer it to a curative review uh which would be a much longer process or they could decide to refer it to a larger bench uh which would be literally a, this is a five bench five judge bench so they could uh, give it to a seven judge bench or a nine judge bench that's up to them but that decision is still a constitutional process they could refuse to do that but we have to wait and see what they decide to do on the first part of your question every party has to do its own self correction and in my honest view the congress party has been trying its changed its president it has changed a number of the senior operating people it has given a lot of responsibility to younger uh, politicians in various places and fresher politicians and it has also showed a new sprightliness on things like social media where the messaging of the congress party for the first time has actually matched and even exceeded the uh, social media presence of the bjp so you're seeing a number of lessons being learned but i would argue with you that this learning of lessons is not an event it's an ongoing process what matters is the receptivity to learn is the openness to correct yourself and the willingness thereby to do better next time that is very much present in the congress party today and i hope you will all reward it in 24 in 2019's elections thank you very much thank you so much thank you so much for being here